Now it is revealed that it is not Iran which is uh, the source of problem in the region. It is this uh, support of Wahhabism. Read New York Times editorial and see what they say. I think this change of atmosphere is very important issue that we is uh, uh, somehow in the broader, larger picture of uh, issues related to the deal. Now on the uh, second question, how it relates to the Iranian domestic uh, scene. Uh, I have to inform you that Iran is a debating society. Uh, actually, it negates the assumptions in the United States on Iran and in the West. A very high debate, uh, debating atmosphere is there on all issues. And, I, th and I, I, I am proud of that because no single issue is there that it is not a public debate on it. We, have, we had an intense debate on the JCPO and we have other, on other issues also. But I think as a deal, Iran is committed to, to, to the deal and it is very important that it is the consensus of the all political elites that it is there. And I think it's not the major issue in the debates which come. Actually, it's too early to discuss because it's going to be in May, but all issues are for debate. Furthermore, I have to say, to really negate the dominant uh, assumptions, Iran is not dependent on any external, even pressures. These assumptions that Iranian, uh, Iranian uh, let's say, society and economy were suffering, of course, we didn't like sanctions. We rejected sanctions, but we also resisted. Right now, Iran is the 18th economy of the world. And uh, Iran is the only country in that region which is not dependent on its security. The only country. We don't import security. We are not part of very alliances in the region, military alliances. And I think it is not just our, politi our security, which is highly domestic, both software size and hardware size. It is our politics also. Our politics is absolutely domestic, uh, indigenous, and really from within. The same with economy. Look, I give you one factor, uh, one fact, uh, and I think I end the, the, the second question. All, almost all exporting, oil exporting countries suffered during the last couple of years because of the uh, decrease in the oil prices. No exception, we can go to details. But what did it, since we don't, we try really, this is the essence of Iran revolution, that is uh, independence, we have, we are the only one who is going to have uh, even a, a, a positive growth rate. Uh, not based on our assessment, based on World Bank assessment, which is going to be 5% uh, in, in the coming year. The reason is the diversification of the Iranian economy and less reliance of oil today. Now, oil is about only 27, I think, of our budget. And so I would say that these uh, external issues are not that important because of the spirit of the Iranian revolution. Now on the third uh, question, can this deal be uh, an example for uh, other deals? I think uh, if there is, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, a attention or attentiveness to the concept of bridge, you know, you have to bridge between different, uh, let's say, interests and to balance between them. And you have to have uh, a building process. Then, of course, of course, by chance it became three Bs. Uh, I think you can make deals, but I think each case of international interaction has its own particularities. There is no equivalent I can find uh, like Iranian nuclear deal with other issues. Because here you had a technical issue that was nuclear technology, you had a a very, uh, let's say, sophisticated, complicated, and complex set of uh, UN and international, uh, uh, let's say, organization involvement, and you had also the concept of negotiation. You referred uh, rightly to the negotiation skills of Iranians, and I think uh, this makes the Iranian deal unique, but I think the spirit can be used. The spirit was that, let's say, let's see, it is not uh, that one side should lose completely and the other side should get 100% of the cake. I think this notion of making bridge uh, balancing 
and building can be applied to other situations, though each case is absolutely of its own particularity. I'm wondering to what extent did it change the, uh, did it trigger the change of geopolitics of the Middle East in the, in the larger con context? You mean the deal? Yes. The deal actually depleted all uh, Iranophobia, uh, let's say industrialists. Uh, you know, we have an, an industry called Iranophobia. Uh, everybody, I mean, a large number of entities are involved in making the others fearful of Iran, and actually their legitimacy is based on this uh, fear which is produced out of nonsense related to Iran. Now they are in a bad situation. I mean, look at uh, Netanyahu. Uh, previously, he had always this, uh, uh, let's say, rhythm of uh, uh, Iranian nuclear deal and uh, uh, using this in everywhere. And actually, what was happening was equating the totality of a very complex historical dynamic society as Iran to one single issue, that is nuclear issue. Then reducing the nuclear issue to weaponization and reducing the weaponization to use of it. And based on this, a, a great fear was there and a strategic calculation. And I think this has ruptured completely. And now they are in a very difficult position. They try to say now Iranian regional behavior is a source of concern, which is absolutely uh, as nonsense as the other arguments, it has changed, the, I think, those uh, players who were reckoning upon this type of uh, argumentation are really in, in a bad situation. Furthermore, now you see uh, uh, the, uh, you asked me about the Iranian election. Uh, Iran, during the last uh, 37, eight years, almost each year had one election one election, and the elections are real. I mean, nobody knows what would be the outcome. It means there is competition, there is debate, and so on and so forth. But those forces, those players, uh, who don't have any constitution yet, and who don't have any elections at all, they were trying to really overcome their legitimacy crisis, legitimacy deficit, governance deficit, and their the fear of Iran. I think they are in a bad situation and it impacts them on a broader strategical landscape. Just to follow up on that, I think there were two issues that um, many who were looking at uh, the agreement expected, but frankly, we're not on the deal. We're not part of the deal and really need to be separated. One is Iranian geopolitical or foreign policy behavior. And that really many people thought and assumed that perhaps Iran being brought into the fold of the international community would somehow change its foreign policy behavior. I think, and that goes to uh, many of the issues uh, that people are concerned about. It's support for Hezbollah, it's continued support for the Syrian regime. Um, I think all of that was never on the table. And I think it's really a fa fallacy for us to think that somehow that was going to be a part of the deal. The second thing that I think many expected was somehow this would strengthen the reformists, that somehow this would empower the reformists in the country, turn down the naysayers of parts of the conservative movement, and strengthen the progressive political part of Iran that we want to see in the West, and it's, not, it's bluntly said so, we want to see empowered. That's not part of the deal either. So I think if you look at the deal as it is, it's a great deal in removing capability and stockpile of Iranian nuclear technology. It did not change Iranian foreign policy behavior. I'm not a fan of Iranian foreign policy. I think, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be very blunt here. Support for Hezbollah is killing Syrian people. There's a direct link there, and I think history will show that one day. But that was not part of the deal. And I think that's, the, that's what need, people need to sort of separate, is that the foreign policy of Iran and its geopolitical calculations will remain as will its domestic internal uh, forces. It's not part of the deal, but that doesn't mean that one has to excuse what's happening either inside or externally. No, and to follow up with that, I, I would agree with that as well. I mean, that was, in a sense, my point is that the deal 
is the first step. It's a very important step. Even if nothing else comes of it, it's a critically important step, right? This is talking about potentially nuclear weapons. However, it shows that a deal can be done, right? To your point about confidence building, this is a step to, to start confidence building. To Mr. Ambassador, your point about potentially faulty assumptions, this is a chance to continue that dialogue to say, okay, you know what? Your views on what uh, America and the West were thinking, maybe that wasn't fully uh, supported. And maybe our views on what Iran was doing was not fully supported. But the more we talk, the more we engage in this, okay, we'll have more confidence, we'll go a little bit further next time. And that is the hope, that's the gamble. Um, I don't think you get to that point to even have a seat at that table unless you've had this deal. Uh, let me open the, the floor to the audience. Um, please raise your hands and please also introduce yourself if, if you want to ask, if you want to make a comment or, or question, and please be brief. Yes. Okay, I'm Friedrich Plöger, former three star German Air Force General, last position Deputy Commander at Ramstein Air Command. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning a possible follow-up uh, uh, discussion area with Iran, and it's uh, a technical issue, but on the other hand also bothering us, and that is the Iranian ballistic missile program. Uh, is there, let's say, a chance that Iran, Iran could be uh, engaged in discussion in uh, negotiating uh, their developing ballistic missile capabilities. Mr. Ambassador, would you like to respond? First of all, uh, Iranian defense issues are of, of our own, and it is not a matter of negotiation. Uh, second, I have to say that during the last 38, Iran has been constant, constantly on defense. No, no, let's say, uh, advanced, uh, sophisticated weapon is sold to Iran. On the contrary, some of the regional players in our neighborhood are getting the most advanced, and I think uh, during the last few years, $200 billion of armaments were uh, sold to them. So you cannot single out one issue out of a, a context. And I think the issue of missile is a part of the Iranian defense system. It's not a matter of negotiation at all, and it should be looked in the context of Iranian defense uh, strategy and doctrine. Are there any other questions? Please. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Marcin Mozanski from the Pulaski Foundation. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that while no doubt the Iranian deal, I think, is a new opening for Iran with the Western community uh, overall, um, I think uh, also that with no doubt it has brought us closer to the understanding of what uh, Iran is thinking and what is the culture of, uh, of, of politics, internal and external, which I think has been lacking, and I agree with that for quite a long time. The challenge I think that we're seeing is that we need much, much more um, engagement on the trust building side um, and see more of the engagement on tangible, um, tangible results in the key areas which affect all of us jointly, and I mean here the broader situation in the, in the, in the Middle East and in Afghanistan, for instance. Uh, and that is something which will take a lot of years of goodwill if we are to have that relation in a, uh, let's call it, you know, balancing act to bring more stability in the region. And I think that there's a big area of progress here. And my question is uh, to, well, the panel, the ambassador, how do you see that you know, happening when there is an ongoing policy in the region with all the main regional players, and that is, goes both for Iran and Saudi Arabia, of really abusing identities 
for the geopolitical gain, and, and that is really hurting uh, the political processes in the countries outside, it's, it's my opinion, but uh, I'd like to hear a comment on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Let us maybe gather the questions, and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes. Marcin Czerdzikowski, Polish Institute of International Affairs. A question to the panel on the Russian factor in the region. So how would you see the, the implementation, the deal itself, and the implementation of the deal uh, enabling more or less, I don't know how you assess it simply, the, pres the geopolitical presence, let's say, of Russia in the region, meaning, of course, the Iranian-Russian cooperation prospects, but also Iranian engagement in the conflict in Syria. How do you assess it? I would like to hear comments from the, from the, from the panel. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Alexandra de for German Marshall Fund in uh, Paris. Um, I wanted to build on what uh, Marcin uh, just said about the geopolitical aspects. As you recognize the panelists themselves, it's difficult to dissociate the geopolitical aspect from the purely nu nuclear aspect. So let's say, you know, the scenario in the five, ten years to come is that Iran more or less complies, uh, but that it is becoming an increasingly spoiling power in the, in the region. I mean, look at Syria uh, without Iran's uh, support to Assad, Assad would have would probably not be be here today. Yemen, uh, Yemen, uh, it's uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran uh, 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 battle with the support of the United States to be a Saudi-led coalition with the catastrophic results we are all aware about. And Iraq, we haven't mentioned uh, Iraq. There again, we more or less uh, support uh, the uh, Shia uh, militias that are also um, uh, partly uh, trained, supported, and financed by Iran. So there is also, I would say, a, a contradiction uh, in uh, you know, our own US Western policies. We uh, confront Iran on one side and uh, more or less support or play with Iran on other. So th my question was, is that really uh, sustainable? And the other one is, uh, you, you all remember uh, Barack Obama's interview in The Atlantic, where uh, he was very much criticized, uh, both in Iran and Saudi Arabia, because he said that the, the future of the region should be handled, you know, and, and should be shared uh, by uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and that uh, if these two powers do not find an agreement in terms of uh, the, the, the future of the region, then uh, not uh, all of the conflicts that we're facing will not be able to, to be solved. So really about the future of the Saudi and, and Iranian relationship seems to be absolutely uh, uh, crucial and uh, how does the U.S. role fit in that? Okay. Any other questions or comments? We've got two. Yes. Please. And I will put also my question and we come back to the panel. Okay, my, my question was that in the region, we all know that Saudi Arabia, Iran has some sort of a turf war going on, uh, just taken on the way to the New York Times, the foreign minister printing articles. Um, keeping that in view, that the only other nuclear co country in that region is Pakistan, and Pakistan obviously seems to have a much closer relationship with Saudi Arabia um, and Iran deal happening. So how is Iran perceiving the relationship between Pakistan and, and Saudi Arabia in regard to the nuclear aspect going forward? Hello, I'm Frank Tanner from the OEC. Just wondering how much, uh, after one year now, the um, disagreement, this joint action uh, has been implemented. I mean, how much is there a routine now? Uh, is the joint commission meeting, or the working groups which have been developed, uh, on what level are these groups meeting? Uh, how often is the IEA uh, involved in verification? Uh, I suppose it's only the IEA which conducts verification. So I think some more details on that will be quite interesting for other organizations as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other or not? Uh, and my question specifically to, to uh, Michael, how, how did it influence American-Israeli relations? <laughs> okay, let's, let's start and come back to the panel, please. So I think on the, I'm trying to combine some of these questions, but I think on the geopolitical and even the link to Russia, I think what is becoming increasingly apparent 
to all of us, and, and it's become a theme of this conference, is that Putin and Russia is not looking to be a constructive power. They're looking to be disruptive. They're looking to sow a bit of dissent, sow a bit of chaos, uh, exploit weaknesses in the West, and then to see what happens, to see how and if it inures sufficiently to Russia's benefit that it keeps pressing and it keeps going. And another theme that is emerging is that in order for us in the West to stop this activity by Russia, we must ourselves be strong. Our alliances have to be strong. Our own internal politics have to be strong. And I think that's important because the deal with Iran shows, yes, that you can do a deal, and it's the P5 plus one, right, that everybody is together, and that there was a united front, because sanctions, for example, don't really work as well when there's only one country doing it. It has to be done together. Uh, so in order to stop Putin's uh, advances in the Ukraine to, uh, to everywhere else, it's important that the West be a united bloc. Now, that is not at all to say that the West needs to be a united bloc against Iran in the same way, but that's the point of what I'm trying to say is it's still an open question is what does, in our mind, Iran do now that the deal has happened? Does Iran want to begin the process of larger integration and, in a sense, moderation as well? And that goes to the confidence building measures to to, uh, to some of the other points that you were saying is to say, okay, no, really, we meant this as defensive. It may have looked as offensive and some of our rhetoric may be offensive, but it really was defensive, right? And that's the, the process we hope to see undergo and I think it's very much linked to um, what we are facing with, with Russia as well. And as far as U.S.-Israel um, relations, they're still very strong, you know. There was a sharp disagreement, to say the least. Um, but it also leads to a very important point, too, is that, and to the larger geopolitical point as well, is that it's not just the alliances between the US and Europe. It's the, the alliances and the partnerships in the Middle East as well. Because that also is going to lead to a measure of stability, whether it's reassuring Israel, who is very and rightfully very concerned, especially at the rhetoric aimed at Israel, not to mention the munitions, that, hey, no, we mean what we say, we will step in. We will defend you, right? Same thing, we need to make sure that Ukraine knows. The West is behind you, it will support you, right? Especially because Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons. So I think all of this is linked, and I think the, to your question about, you know, the traditional alliances the U.S. has, it has to be strong, and it has to be made stronger. But, and this is what President Obama said on his inauguration day, we're looking for more alliances, including with Iran. We're looking for better relationships with Iran. It's a process, it'll take time, a lot of confidence building measures, a lot of trust, but the door is always open for that. Yes. Yeah, I'll pick up on the geopolitical issue. You know, there is a Cold War in the Arab world today, uh, and that Cold War is being fueled by both the Iranian and the Saudi regimes. And I think it's to the detriment and folly of, um, of the Arab people. People from Bahrain, Yemen, Syria uh, are suffering as a result of this Cold War battle for so-called uh, preeminence of the Islamic world. And really quite sadly, because uh, they are dying in droves, they're being starved in droves, and these two actors continue to claim that they hold the mantle of the right Islam. And sadly, if you were to poll most Arabs today and ask them, would you ever want to live in Iran or Saudi Arabia, that would be the furthest of their imagination. Those are two countries that nobody wants to live in. And that's because they represent Islam, that neither, neither view of Islam is the view that they want to follow. And so they are being put in the middle of this geopolitical battle and paying the ultimate price for it. Today, people are starving in Yemen. People are dying in droves in Yemen. We see in Syria today, half the country is displaced, half a million people killed, and the vast majority at the hands of the Assad regime. Similarly, in Bahrain, people looking for good ultimate price for it. Today, people are starving in Yemen. People are dying in droves in Yemen. We see in Syria today, half the country is displaced, 
half a million people killed, and the vast majority at the hands of the Assad regime. Similarly, in Bahrain, people looking for good governance, looking to overthrow and to put in more respectable government are being uh, imprisoned and denied their rights. This is all at the expense of the Arab people themselves. And I think that this is something that you know we have ignored and we've given so much attention to the Saudi-Iranian dimension, but we really lost track of how the people on the ground are suffering as a result of this battle. And I really wish that this would be something that we could have some sort of mediation, but it just doesn't look like it because nobody wants to bring these two parties together to really resolve the core issues. Um, I think into, into another issue that uh, was brought up as well, um, in terms of the Israeli position on this. You know, I think the Israelis really did try to use the Iranian nuclear deal to create a wedge. To create a wedge, uh, not just with the international community, but in, even in U.S. politics. It's understandable that they try to use the, to play the Republicans against the Democrats in an attempt to, uh, in effect, uh, create this as a wedge issue. And, you know, one of the things that I think is impressive is that we did see the Democrats attempt to undermine each other at the suffering of the Arab people. And similarly, I think that we'll see that this was ultimately a good thing in, in removing this terrible weapon of, of nuclear, nuclear technology in the hands of uh, a government um, that I have no qualms with in terms of their foreign policy. And I want to just point out too that, you know, Iran is a rational actor. I think one of the things you said earlier, you're absolutely right, you know, this argument that somehow because of the bad experience with Ahmadinejad that somehow Iran is not a rational actor needs to be you know, removed from our, from our vocabulary. We have securitized it, we have militarized it, and unnecessarily so. You know, I think it's uh, safe to say that there have been many uh, uh, level-headed uh, arguments, and whether it's the Supreme Leader and others who've said very clearly that they would never use nuclear technology, and nuclear weapons for military purposes. And I believe that. And even I am a, a great critic of Iranian foreign policy, but still believe that because we need to give it credit as being a rational actor and stop using this language of somehow it's irrational, crazy menace in the world. It's not helpful and really does, I think, perpetuate this, uh, this unnecessary myth of Iranophobia. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I have ref to refer to the fast food analysis again. You know, analysis is the base of everything. If we had a good analysis, authentic one, reflecting the reality, our judgment would be totally different from quick, let's say, very speedy analysis. I think what I heard, there are different files, different issues. They are in actuality separated from each other, though they are linked in a broader regional context. Some of them don't have easy solutions and quick answers, but it is very easy to put them under one package of Iranian geopolitical competition with Saudi Arabia. I think it is not uh, right uh, uh, analytically uh, not to really be enough uh, detailed on each of these files and then have a quick judgment. With this introduction very quickly, on the issue of trust, the question is, my friend, who should trust whom? Should I trust the United States, who puts the worst sanction on a country like Iran under the, this pretext that it has a nuclear uh, technology, which may possibly be used once in the future context for other non, uh, let's say, peaceful measures, and not even one single statement on nuclear weapons of Israel mentioned by United States. Should I trust this power? Should I trust a power who is occupying this nation and that nation? And, and I go to the American literature, read what Obama said when he was running for the first time. United States made unnecessary wars. Should I trust them? Or the other Westerners? Should I, uh, other external forces? So the trust is a mutual, is not one-sided. It should be, be built, but it should be built upon actions. And I think narratives are here very important. International, you, you know, you have certain vocabulary using and certain narratives, then you happily come with your own conclusion. I think trust is a very important issue, but we should see how we can trust, not just United. It is not that you have 
a dichotomy of goods versus bads. So it is a very, very important issue. The second on the geopolitics of region. Geopolitics of region is very complicated. Iranian ascendancy in the region is not because of its competition with Saudi Arabia at all. Look what happened during the last 38 years, along with the domestic, let's say, source of Iranian power, which is very important. So our power is not, as I said, is not relied on the other, but it is domestic. It's a revolution from within. But the collapse of Soviet Union gave Iranian a strategic space in its northern borders, uh, a very significant uh, opportunity which was absent for three centuries. Then the collapse of Taliban and collapse of Saddam Hussein particularly. It was a great a strategic change. Was it because of Saudi Arabia or not at all? And I think it is a very complicated issue. On these files that you mentioned, Yemen, is Iran that powerful to meddle in everything and make such a situation? I think it is wrong to see Iran everywhere and to neglect what the others have done. It is the easiest way to say so. But I think the Iranian ascendance geopolitically relates to some domestic regional and international factors, and that is a fact of life, the more important dimension of it is to accept it, not to deny it. Not just, uh, I'm happy that you underlined the rationality of Iranian foreign policy. I would like also to say Iran is more mature than the other uh, players, and I explain very quickly. You know, believe it or not, now the international system has become op more open compared to the bipolar system. And in this, in this existing system, regional players have more to play. Be it here, be it in the Middle East, be it in, in, in Latin America. And in our region, we have several regional players, including my country. And I can bet not because I'm Iranian, I can go on a rational, analytical frame that Iran has acted more maturely than the others. How? I refer to Syria because Syria was refer, uh, refers a couple of times. Suppose tomorrow, I mean, there was a more military confrontation, a regime change there, either by external intervention or by these terrorist groups. Now you have this refugee crisis in Europe. And here in Poland, you also test that refugee. It is because of the miscalculation and immaturity of both regional actors and international actors on the issue of Syria. And I think if you are brave enough to really look at the different files and see the issue of Bahrain, it is purely lack of democratic processes. The majority really doesn't have access to power because of the dominance of a, a minority. So I think these issues of uh, regional geopolitics should be taken into account with a more uh, analytical frame. Finally, on the issue of inspection, uh, if I understand your question right, I think uh, there are, of course, IEA mechanism, plus UN is involved at large, and EU. So I think, it, but on the issue of technicalities, because the technical issue of nuclear technology is done by IEA, there would be no other. But on the other uh, sides, there are you know, different reviews of sanction removal and so on and so forth. But I think there is not a very uh, a specific institution that I can uh, refer to. Uh, so this is what I have to say. And uh, of course, uh, I would end by saying that it is not misusing of identity in this geopolitical regime. Iran is not for confrontation, for uh, Cold War, for increasing conflicts with Syria. We have been on the record that we want a peaceful uh, resolution of conflicts and disputes. And it is not uh, one way. I mean, it's not just uh, one case, many cases. Of course, 
we don't entrapped in their sense of escalation, some of them, of course, because Saudi Arabia is a state of very difficult situation domestically, regionally, but I think Iran by no means is for increasing uh, tensions uh, in its uh, regional uh, atmosphere and its in vicinity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me say that unfortunately we, we've run out of time, but we haven't mentioned during this panel the one uh, very important actor who, who really contributed to, to this deal, and it was the European Union, and I think this is no coincidence because today we experience another um, blow for geopolitical consequences, I think, caused by small Wallonia. Um, and uh, this, is, this is an open question for the future, to what extent uh, we'll have a transatlantic unity. Um, over many issues, but let me uh, please join me in applauding our, our great speakers. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and I think we... Thank you.